Hi, I'm Eric Christian Olson. I'm here on behalf of Harvard Chan Sea Change, the Environmental Media Association, where I serve on the board of directors. This is a part of the series I host called EMA Talks Real Science, where we give our viewers the opportunity to hear directly from scientists on important climate, equity, environmental, and public health issues. Today, we are having conversation that is way out of my grasp of knowledge uh, with Dr. Melinda Tambe, an artificial intelligence for social good. Melinda Tambe is a Gordon McKay Professor of Computer Science and the Director of the Center for Research and Computation and Society at Harvard University. He is also the Director of AI for Social Good at Google Research India. Professor Tambe's work focuses on advancing AI and multi-agent systems for public health, conservation, public safety, with a track record of building pioneering AI systems for social impact. How is that for an intro? Great. Thank you. Thank you for that very kind introduction. Well, it's all true. I think it's important as we talk about these shows to always, you know, our goal is to go to the smartest person in the room and then talk about all the things that we need to know. And let's, let's, let's go back to the basics before we get into these questions. Of all topics to go into, why did you choose to use your skill set uh, to tackle AI? I got into AI because I was reading a lot of science fiction. I was reading uh, Asimov uh, when I was a kid, uh, you know, watching Star Trek. Uh, yeah. This was in India. So this was old, old reruns of old Star Trek and whatnot. But uh, it got me hooked uh, into thinking about AI. And so that's how I uh, got into AI, motivated by science fiction, but always uh, had this interest in applying AI for societal benefit. And so all of these came together in the you know, past 15 years or more. I've been focused on how we could directly apply AI for social good. Um, can you, for all of us to start off this conversation, give us a, an example, a very clear example of what AI, artificial intelligence for social good means? Just like, like I can throw it up on a wall and say for my seven-year-old, this is what AI for social good means. Right. It's... First of all, AI for social good means social good has to be achieved in the real world. Some real, actual, ah. impactful thing has to happen in the real world. It's not enough to say we were motivated by this and we did some research, which in the lab, it's not, that's not AI for social good. AI for social has to be deployed. Usually it is work that is for some uh, marginalized, underserved community or endangered community which has not benefited from AI. And this is uh, where we talk about, uh, you know, youth experiencing homelessness. We talked about um, farmers who may be committing suicide. Uh, we talked about uh, endangered wildlife. So these are real problems. Uh, these are populations that have not benefited from AI. And so we are trying to provide uh, benefits to them. If you are an AI researcher, then I would also say, well, it has to also advance AI. but AI for social good uh, is really taking AI out in the field and really deploying it for these kinds of uh, causes, if that, if that helps. Totally helps. It's not theoretical, practical application. So if you're a researcher using AI in a lab, this is a call to arms to partner up with an NGO, get out in the field and make a difference. Exactly right. Can you talk about how you're currently using that AI to advance public health research and, and, and how you used AI during this last year of pandemic and quarantine? So generally the things we have focused on is how we can use AI to optimize our limited resources. In the case of public health, we have large populations to serve, but limited public health resources or limited number of social workers. And so concrete example is work we've done with youth experiencing homelessness in Los Angeles, where uh, harnessing the social networks of these youth, this is face-to-face -face networks, we are able to show that AI algorithms are far more effective in spreading HIV information and reducing HIV risk behaviors by picking the right kinds of influencers compared to the traditional approaches that are used in the drop-in centers and so on. So whereas, um, the, kinds of techniques people use is to recruit the most popular youth. What the AI algorithms do is to pick the youth that are more strategically placed in the network and that results in better outcomes. And so we just completed a trial in Los Angeles with uh, 
750 youth that showed, showed uh, these results. Another example is tuberculosis prevention in India, where one problem is people are supposed to take their medicine for six months, but uh, they'll start taking the medicine and then drop off, which is a problem for themselves because they don't get well and then they lead to drug resistant bacteria. Right. And so if we can predict ahead of time who's going to drop out of treatment by looking at their behavior patterns, in this case, behavior pattern is they're supposed to give a call every time they take their medicine. And so just by looking at the pattern of phone calls, who called when, and maybe one day, you know, somebody missed the call and so on and so forth, we can predict in advance, this person is going to drop out of treatment so that healthcare workers can remind them not to drop off, to encourage them to stay in the program. And so that's another uh, piece of work that we've done based on past data. So those are the kinds of things that we've done for HIV prevention and TB prevention. Just out of curiosity, because we had this conversation last week about um, passing along information and data and science and the difference between um, uh, horizontal conversations versus talking down to somebody. So when the AI figured out strategically, there were certain strategic partners to use that were not influencers. What does that mean? Who, who did they find out was the most compelling person to have horizontal conversations? So these are people who might be connectors across different subgroups. So because these are, they're different sub communities in the community, community of youth experiencing. So there may be people who may be hanging out on the Venice beach together, people playing basketball together and so forth. So they might be youth who are actually talking across different subgroups, for example. Right. And so these are, these are the people. So if you just recruit people who are most popular uh, then they are all congregated at the center of the overall social network. Uh, whereas if you recruit youth using this AI reasoning, then you are getting to the edges of the network, getting to different sub communities. And you're trying to talk to people, try to find influencers who are talking to different sub communities, for example. And how and much so, more Sorry, go ahead. Uh, no, no. Uh, the, the interesting thing here is that the social network is actually not known to us ahead of time. And we don't want to go out and map out the whole social network. So we just sample the social network. Uh, we just get 20% uh, of the network by asking a few youth who their friends are. And then just based on that, figure out who the key influencers are. So it's not like we have the full network and then we get to reason through that. So there's sort of a lot of uh, clever reasoning that can be done with AI without invading perhaps you know, without having a lot of work to be done on uh, mapping out the full network and so on and so forth. And what was the success rate difference you said between that type of communication versus just standard influencers? So the, in, at the end of one month uh, with the AI algorithm, there was 30% reduction in HIV risk behaviors and there's none at the end of one month with the standard approach. At the end of three months, uh, you know, there was they, the difference started to reduce, but having this behavior change faster is important. And this work was done with the uh, USC School of Social Work. And so I have to thank my collaborator, Professor Eric Rice there. Um, shout, so, out. shout out right there. Say that again? A little shout out to your partner at USC. What was his name again? Eric Rice. All right, Eric Rice. Saving 30% save in, uh, in activities uh, that can transmit HIV and homeless teens in Los Angeles is that's the definition of what we're doing, right? That's social good through AI. And I have to imagine that that the, the amounts put into that as far as uh, financial capital necessary to run that program would be much less expensive than traditional means, right? Uh, I mean, we are not doing anything over and above what is needed traditionally. Uh, we are, I mean, the, the sampling and so forth is done quickly by just you know querying a few youth who are in the drop-in center. So there's not much difference in the investments that are made uh, from the traditional approaches. Uh, you also asked a question about the pandemic and I can just very briefly tell you, uh, we worked with our partners here at the Harvard Chan School of Public Health uh, with Professor Michael Mina, for example, and others, but the one study that he has, uh, he has championed, and we are glad that we could support it, uh, was, you know, you have different kinds of tests entering the market now to 
check for COVID. Uh, there's the PCR test, which is very active, high sensitivity. You need low uh, viral concentrations. You can check with uh, PCR tests. And then there's the rapid antigen test, which only can check things at a high, low viral concentration. So basically you got a gold standard test um, that is slower, but can check for lower um, viral concentration. And you got the antigen test, which is fast, but requires higher viral concentrations. Yeah. And sometimes I get the lower and higher mixed up, but I think I've got, got that it. right. I read, I read this article, so I'm with you. Yeah, okay. And so um, what we did is uh, with simulations showed that despite the fact that the PCR test can check things at low viral concentrations, the um, rapid antigen tests are actually better. Uh, if you're testing, you know, if you're Harvard and you want to check all the student population, um, and then anybody who's found to be positive, you isolate, for example. The thought is that the PCR test would be better, but it turned out in simulations, we we're able to show that these rapid antigen tests are actually better uh, just because the more, you know, the PCR test gets returns that are slower to get back. And uh, because it's more expensive, maybe you can't run it as frequently. So with that difference, it turns out that the rapid antigen tests are better. And Michael, of course, is the one who's been championing it. So we are very glad that we could support it uh, via our study. As I'm talking about this, I realized that I have probably messed up the uh, lower and the higher concentrations, but you get the point. No, you didn't. I, I mean, because that article blew my mind, which essentially to put it into terms for you know silly people like me, was that even though the rapid test was not as accurate, because you got it back faster, it was more efficient than the more effective test with a longer delay. So therefore, there was more time for exposure for the COVID to pass along, right? That's right. That's right. All right. All right. We're done for the day. <laughs> we got it. We got it. You and I. I mean, that's because it's, you know, I, 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 I think this is such a, a longer conversation because when we talk about AI for social good, and we talk about passing along good information, right? So you're giving an example of homeless teens in, 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 in LA and, and how to practice uh, safe sex or, or, or whatever it is that you're doing to prevent the transmission of HIV. Like there's so much bad information being passed around um, through algorithms, uh, for instance, on YouTube, when people go down the rabbit hole until they end up on Q, right. what, what do we... <laughs> How do we navigate AI being used for the opposite of social good? Uh, this is a big problem that, uh, you know, that clearly there are the uses of AI. I mean, in, in that particular case, I know YouTube has uh, taken steps to try to reduce the amount of, you know, rabbit holes people can go down on, present the, the second side of the story uh, as well and so forth. But in our, I mean, in our work, the focus has always been how to push AI towards uh, social good in terms of trying to pos find positive applications and try to think through the implications of that. I just wanted to very briefly touch on uh, wildlife conservation as the other example uh, before we switch, uh, uh, switch off. So, you know, this is work that uh, where we are harnessing past poaching data to able to predict where poachers may set traps or snares. And for the past several years, uh, working in Uganda and Cambodia, for example, I've been able to remove a large number of these snares, hundreds or even thousands. And so hopefully that is uh, helping, you know, protect endangered wildlife. And so this is something that we are now making available to national parks around the globe so that they can download, you know, they can start using the software. 60 other countries in 800 wild spaces, yeah? That's right, that's right. <laughs> that's exactly right. Yeah, it's a, it's a very, uh, yeah, it's, I mean, we've traveled to some of these places, uh, you know, Uganda, Cambodia, Malaysia, and others. And it's really uh, amazing what the rangers do for little pay and really uh, threats to their own life to protect wildlife. And so we're very glad that uh, using AI, we can potentially help them by offering them tools that make their jobs a little easier in terms of being able to predict where poachers may set traps and get them removed before they kill wildlife, for example. 
That's incredible. And what was the success rate of that? What was the percentage of? So in Cambodia, the uh, numbers of snare captures jump fivefold compared to what they had before. And I mean, I was so happy. I mean, you know, there's this one time when I remember like the beginning of 2019, they sent us photographs of here's all the snare captures, you know, here's all the different traps that we'd found. And, and I was thinking, really, I mean, I, I just wasn't, you know, it was just like, this is not believable. This must, you must be, uh, you know, this must not be from our program. This was, but yeah, it was, it was true. And they were saying that whereas uh, rangers would go out and maybe find 10 or 20 uh, traps during one patrol, now suddenly they were coming back with 100 or 200. And uh, it was just, it's just been very satisfying to see these kinds of things happening. That is the definition of like life and work affirming action. Like to have that kind of outcome, that's got to be, that's got to be an amazing moment of realization, whether you're, you know, saving, you know, teenagers from getting HIV or, or saving rhinos, elephants. Um, what was it in Cambodia they were using snares on? They, uh, they're different kinds of deer, for example. Um, and this is important because they, you know, tigers have been decimated in Cambodia. They're trying to re uh, get tigers to be, uh, to be reintroduced it. But you need the prey back in the forest before you can introduce tigers. And so that's, uh, that's where we are today. And once that stabilizes, then they'll introduce tigers into the wildlife there. Yeah, that's amazing. I mean, and that, and that again, that kind of purpose in life is really wonderful. And we celebrate that and you. The science fiction nerd of me, which I know obviously exists inside of you as well, because you started off with Star Trek. Um, do you want to talk at all about um, counterterrorism, operational security using theoretical algorithms at LAX? Oh, that's uh, amazing. Well, that uh, I have to give a shout out to another uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Professor Eros Sothers at USC, who was then the assistant chief of airport police at the LA airport. And so, yeah, I mean, we started working with him to use game theory. So. There's eight inbound roads into the LA airport, as we know, and not in, there was, this was back in 2007, the threat of somebody driving a truck into the airport uh, that would, you know, have perhaps carry a bomb, something like that. And so they were running checkpoints. And the question is, how can we manage, how can we place checkpoints around these eight inbound roads when you don't have enough, you can't have checkpoints on every single road. And so that's what we provided uh, an algorithm that would randomize checkpoints, taking into account how many passengers are present at different uh, terminals and also canine patrols. And so this was, uh, you know, this algorithm got used uh, at LAX starting 2007. Then we got called by the federal air marshals how to assign air marshals to flight. So from a AI, uh, game theory, you know, like algorithm perspective, these are like massive, massive, uh, I'll go, you know, data sets or problems to work on like uh, 3000 flights a day. Uh, if you imagine 3000 flights a day and however many number of air marshals, the number of combinations is astronomical. So how do you assign? So Coast Guard patrols, but in each of these cases, you know, for example, we were asked uh, to first time we went, met the Federal Air Marshal Service. This was at the TSA Freedom Center. And right at the entrance is this memorial to 9-11 victims with um, pieces of the Pentagon, pieces of the planes that crashed into the World Trade Center, rubble from the World Trade Center and so forth. And this was the, you know, this is right at the, in the lobby as a memorial to the 9-11 victims. And so it was just very motivating to, when they said, you know, this is, you help us with, or, or, you know, this is what the work that we will do. This was very motivating to say, yeah, I mean, we're really, we are motivated. We want to work with you and make sure that we can do a good job uh, with, uh, you know, this randomized assignment and so on. So on the one hand, this has led to wonderful AI research, uh, great problems for my PhD students to work on, very motivating. Um, and at the same time, hopefully provided some benefit to society. And so in AI for social good, that's been one of the great things is like these are Great topics to do research on, advancing algorithms in very interesting ways, while hopefully providing things that are beneficial uh, to society in some way. Love it. I love it. Do you want to talk at all about how that AI um, works in the realm of climate change? 
So we haven't uh, very directly worked on topics that are associated with climate change, but the kinds of things we've done impact uh, climate change. So for example, the pause system that I mentioned for protecting wildlife can also be used to protect uh, forests from illegal logging. Mm. And, you know, so deforestation, of course, has been reducing our carbon sinks. And so if we can protect forests in this fashion, that's something that would be important to do. Um, similarly, one of the topics we've been working on is trying to reduce human wildlife conflict. And so can we, you know, if we, because deforest, because of deforestation, uh, clearly there's been less forest for wildlife and therefore there is more human wildlife conflict. And so in some sense, the work we are doing there is trying to reduce the impact of climate change by reducing yep. human wildlife conflict. So it's topics of that type that we've um, picked up on. And uh, we would certainly like to see more of this kind of work being done and uh, for, you know, for ourselves. But uh, these are topics where we are trying to combat the impact of climate change uh, via AI. Yeah, and, and the next pandemic, because if you start talking, you know, uh, Christopher Golden, the, that's, right. that's with the intersection of, of uh, you know, deforestation and the animals, and that's where humans make contact, and that's where we see the transfer of, of you know, potential that, global pandemics and viruses. That's right. That's, that's exactly right as well. No, that's... Yeah, this is all very, this is, there's so much to uh, talk about and lots of directions to think Well, about. do you have, and this is, you don't have to answer this, but do you have any theoretical areas you'd like to explore using AI that you haven't had a chance to do yet or the technology doesn't exist? Like if you had it, like in the next, if you looked over the next 15 years, you'd like, I'd like to have AI tackle this. What would it, what would those, what would three of those things be? I mean, the topics that we have focused on, public health, conservation, right. agriculture being the third one, these are things that I really would love to kind of push ahead on. And we, you know, the pandemic, clearly this is going to be something, uh, you know, with the, where we are with climate change, uh, all the pressures on human civilization and movement and mobility and all of that. I mean, all of these things, I mean, we're just gonna see more, uh, more of uh, these pandemics uh, coming through, um, more of, uh, you know, problems for agriculture going forward because of climate change. Uh, we, you know, this uh, is a tremendous problem for farmers in developing countries. On the one hand, you got floods, um, and on the other hand, you got droughts, and it's just, uh, you know, livelihoods are being destroyed on a mass scale. And so, these are problems that we need to uh, really tackle. I mean, you, you may have heard about farmer suicides, for example, on a mass scale in India because of, I mean, in, in part because of climate change really just impacting lives. And so these are things that we, uh, you know, in the next 10 years are things that I would really like to focus on. And from an AI side, what happens is that you start working on these problems which are really important in terms of their social impact. And automatically they deliver for us completely new AI problems that we hadn't thought of before. And so, uh, you know, people sometimes ask me, how do you come up with new, I mean, students ask me, how do I come up with a new PhD topic? And my answer is, well, you just try and solve these real world problems and automatically some problems. new, new yeah. AI topic comes up. Do you have a specific example of a large scale application of AI for social good in agriculture? Like what would that look like? Uh, talk about the first two, but the last one I can't wrap my head around yet. Right, no, I think, um, so some, I mean, one of the things that uh, you could imagine, for example, I mean, this is related to flooding and, and agriculture is how much water to release from a dam. Hmm. Uh, you would think that by now we know exactly, but that's not, quite true. So this is an interesting problem because you read, you know, with monsoons, for example, and so on, again, with climate change uh, playing a role, figuring out how much water to release from a dam uh, becomes a big problem. And so sometimes there's too much release and there's huge floods and a lot of people die. 
And if you don't release just the right amount, then downstream farmers and fisheries and all kinds of uh, problems arise. So coming up with the right balance becomes an interesting problem as just as a very quick uh, top of mind example. But there are uh, many others about uh, the right kinds of crop patterns to, to uh, plot and so forth, the right amount of irrigation. I mean, there's just uh, another thing people do is uh, finding out if crops have diseases, um, you know, what kind of disease a particular plant might be suffering from uh, to do that very quickly using AI. So there's a number of things that can be done. Um, there's also things about um, the right prices for uh, agricultural goods because you, you want farmers to get the right prices for their products. And so AI can help uh, in doing the right kinds of matchmaking. So lots of things. I'm sure there is a, you know, this is not something that I've really honestly investigated thoroughly. Oh, that's to have four captured. good examples. That's four examples that totally make sense to me. It's always hard for me to wrap my head on how that would be uh, applicable, but I, that, that, totally, that totally makes sense. Um, I think that, you know, listen, Hollywood has a lot to blame for this, which is there's a preconceived notion about the role that AI plays in humanity. And we have movies like The Terminator and we have, you know, the, the, I was listening to the, po the podcast in the New York Times about the rabbit hole and the French uh, mathematician who came up with the algorithm for Google and then sold it to YouTube. So every time we hear about AI, all we hear is that it's going to be the death of us all. Having listened to you for you know 33 minutes, you start to see oh there's the potential for like any great Star Wars. There's good versus evil. There's an opportunity for great good within this technology. Is that something that you think is going to gain momentum? Yes. Uh, there's sort of two sides to this. On the one side, you got a lot of hunger for this kind of work among students, um, among re AI researchers, because they can see that what they are doing has great value and they would love to contribute to society. And then on the other hand, you have, uh, you know, these nonprofits around the world who are doing amazing work. I mean, sometimes I listen to these folks doing this really incredible work in different in difficult circumstances. And many of them carry with them a lot of data and they're sitting on this data, which, you know, is great. And so if you can bring those two groups together I can imagine that there's going to be tremendous amount of work that can be done in AI for social good. That's actually one of the things I'm doing as a AI director of AI for social good at Google Research India is to bring together AI researchers and nonprofits. So both can apply to the program and then we do matchmaking to try and figure out who works with whom uh, and, and allow them to work together. I mean, with, with our help and so forth. And so I, I feel there's tremendous scope for it. Uh, there's clearly tremendous AI problems uh, that, uh, you know, which are important for researchers if they want to work on new and newer and newer problems. So there's all these nonprofits who have all these problems and then they got talent. And so I think, I think we can do a lot by doing this kind of worldwide matchmaking if we can succeed in getting the talent to the right place where we need it. And I mean, I'm, hope, I'm hope, hopefully doing my own part in it, but uh, if more of us can do that, I think there'll be like tremendous amounts of work that can be done in this area. Yeah, I mean, that, you just, that was just the Spider-Man theme, which is with great power comes great responsibility. We just gotta find these people that have this data and the researchers and these brains and get them to do social good versus trading derivatives. <laughs> just, with, <laughs> just, with, just with their pocketbooks, like algorithms for how to, you know, screw over the stock market. Um, let's, uh, let's talk about takeaways. I think it's one of the most important things for, you know, as, as this is watched, it's all um, for, for a lot of people, including myself, it's, there, it, there's so much theoretical information that we can't use in our, in our everyday life. What is, um, what are the takeaways about uh, AI for our own lives as individuals and to make ourselves healthy and, and, and more, and making the world more sustainable? If you are, um, you know, the first takeaway is what you just mentioned that don't be thinking about AI as this great negative uh, power that's out there that's going to destroy us all. And, you know, just the horrible image that AI has. I've been, you know, yep. I've been in these panel discussions where I feel like, oh, 
you know, AI is not that, not just, you know, yes, there are these challenges we need to address them, but there's a tremendous amount of good that can happen with AI. And if we can somehow encourage that in some way, like we just discussed in some right. of matchmaking and so forth, a lot of good can happen. Um, and if you are a nonprofit or what have you, it's not necessary that you're sitting on tons of data before AI can help. Sometimes, you know, you can compensate for the lack of data. And uh, there are ways in which uh, you can, if you can form partnerships with researchers who know about AI, and there are a lot of people who really, really want to help um, or somehow try to bring their talent to use in, in this sort of societally beneficial way then that would be tremendous uh, to use. And for my friends who are working in, in AI, I want to encourage them to say, hey, you know, get out of the lab, go out in the field, form partnerships with, with uh, colleagues in social work and conservation and climate change. And there's so much good that we can do um, while simultaneously benefiting ourselves as AI researchers. So it's a win-win for all. So I guess those are possibly some takeaways. That's the, that was it. You just gave the speech. You gave it, I mean, that's, you know, that's the, that's the hero's journey, which is a call to use your skill set for the powers of good to betterment and the betterment of humanity. I mean, that's it. There's nothing else to, there's nothing <laughs> else to be said. I mean, I, 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 it's, it's hard for me not to get on the rabbit hole of, uh, of the other side of AI, which is the stuff that we're presented on a regular basis, but I think people know that. So I think this is why this conversation is so important is because this is a very refreshing, um, optimistic look at our future with exactly what you're talking about, which is matchmaking and these workshops of, of finding NGOs that are you know working for the betterment of humanity and then bringing on all this data and researchers to, to make a difference. I think that's a really inspiring uh, goal and you know the conversation we have at my house all the time because I think growing up so much of it was like you get a job you know you, you find success and you, you put food on the table and a lot of reframing about you know existential crisis us as a society what is our purpose why are we here and what can we do to make the world a better place and I think these are all these are all great examples of that and uh, at the highest level so I that's it you broke it down into conservation, agriculture, and public health. Do you want to talk um, specifics at all uh, for conservation within those three? Right. So we've been building this system called PAWS, uh, whereby it's protection assistant for wildlife security. I guess we are always high on, uh, you know, like getting the right acronyms. Anyhow, um, PAWS so is PAWS, pretty good. PAWS is a pretty good acronym. So we um, made the, you know, the focus is, can we predict where poachers set traps or snares for endangered wildlife? And so we did this work, uh, 2016, we did our first system. And then we, this is work with Uganda Wildlife Authority and Wildlife Conservation Society for Queen Elizabeth National Park in Uganda. That was the first test site. And so we said, we've done this work and they wanted to do a pilot test, no matter how many graphs and charts we produced in the lab, that was obviously not convincing enough. Can we do a pilot test in the field? So we selected two areas uh, in Queen Elizabeth National Park. That was our first ever pilot test, I guess, first test of machine learning in the field for predicting where poachers might set traps. And so we selected these two areas that they had not patrolled before or had not patrolled for several months or even a year or longer. And then we said, you're going to find traps over there uh, in, in these areas. And they said, said uh, they did patrols for a month. And the goal was that they should find something, right? Because uh, if they hadn't patrolled there, that means they didn't think it was that important. But the machine learning system was saying, you're going to find something there. And so it was a very stressful time for me and my students because uh, you know, <laughs> now we're really, really being tested for real. And initially there was no, you know, they would patrol, they would send back an email saying nothing found, nothing found. Then at, after some time they found a uh, poached elephant with its tusks cut off. So we were too late for that elephant, but at least the machine learning system was pointing us in the right direction. 
Then they said they found the next day, they found a whole elephant snare roll and removed it. So poachers were active in the area. They were killing elephants, but before they could kill the next set of elephants, this uh, elephant snare roll was removed. So, you know, it, it was sort of this grateful feeling that we were able to potentially save lives of elephants. And then they found the antelope snares and removed them. I should point out that since this was a very stressful test, I had at some point uh, promised my students that if they, for every snare that was found, I was going to buy them a drink because, uh, you know, it's like, but at this point, just the students were like, okay, we can't, we can't take this anymore because the success was, we thought we'll find maybe one or two. <laughs> this was, this was really working out very well. Um, but that was the start from there onwards. Uh, we did extensive tests in two national parks in Uganda um, and one in Cambodia, where we selected many areas where we predicted in advance that they're going to find more snares or less snares. These are all areas that they had infrequently patrolled. And indeed, where we predicted a high number of snares, more snares were found. Where we predicted less number of snares, very few snares were found. This is where they found that the number of snare captures jumped fivefold in Cambodia. And so this is really, this is what was instrumental in building up this confidence with our partners, World Wildlife Fund, Wildlife Conservation Society and others. And this is why PAUSE is now, we are very happy to see going global to national parks all over. So this, yeah, so that's, that's basically how PAUSE has evolved over time. That is the perfect example. And, and in that article, it said, you know, 60 more countries and 800 uh, more uh, wildlife areas. I mean, that is the definition of success of, of AI for social good. Um, and as we talked about, like that's the definition of, of finding purpose. Thank you. What a great conversation. I really enjoyed it. And uh, thank you and a lot of fun. And hopefully, uh, you know, it's uh, our viewers, reader, whatever listeners will find this interesting as well. I, I enjoyed it. Is, our goal is always to make it digestible, right? I think that so much of, of, of these conversations can get lost in the weeds. You just, you just make it digestible. And you did, as Peter said, a wonderful job of, of, of doing that.